All right. So I have here with me uh, composer Wilbert Roger II, um, and and I'm really excited to talk to you. You've got a big game going on right now, Mortal Kombat 11. I think yeah. we're like a day or are we like a day or so. I don't know if it's the exact date, but we're like very close to a spawn release on that game. Yes. Which is In yeah. One day, I think. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So of the day, you know, of the time recording this, we're one day away from Spawn getting in there, which is crazy because now you've got like Spawn is going to mix it up with like 72 year old version of Arnold Schwarzenegger's Terminator. It's yep. and the original thought? Shang Tsung, Kerry Tagawa is in it. It's yep. This whole this whole project has played out like game development fan fiction. Like it's, it's, I know like you dreamed that this could have happened for like a million years. People have wanted Spawn. People have wanted the actors from the movies. Uh, the Joker is in it, but like in like the full on M rated Joker, which we've never had yep. before. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy, but uh, I'm very happy with what's going on. Yeah, who would have thought that like the first Mortal Kombat, I mean, I remember being a kid. You had, I, I'm 35, I think we're about the same age. And yeah. yeah, and I remember being a kid, first of all, like remember how freaked out everyone was like, oh my gosh, there's blood on like the old 16 <laughs> bit SNES. But then, Who'd have thought like that little game with like those eight very strange characters would be like mixing it up with, you know, like I said, 72 year old Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and Spawn from the comics. And like, oh my gosh, it's so cool it's, and so strange. Crazy. I mean, they, they dreamed big from the start. Like it was supposed to be what, like a John claude Van Damme game or something. Like they wanted that Hollywood stuff from the start. And that's why they used real actors for the um, you know, the digitized sprites. They wanted people who really had the look and uh, obviously the martial arts talent. Uh, and they didn't really compromise in that regard. So it's always kind of been, you know, aim for the cinematic stars. Uh, so yeah, it's really, it's really cool that finally it's come around full circle. I think 11 is the first time since Mortal Kombat 3 that they've used real actors as the visuals. Like previously it was, um, reference i'm pretty sure but like you know just like high quality human made assets for all the characters but now it's full on digital scans for all the faces and that's how they are able to look exactly like i mean in carrie tagawa's case obviously shang Tsung, but they had a series of actors and uh models that they scanned for the different uh personas and uh, that's what you're seeing in game now that's crazy you know i was just thinking now remembering back to like the original few that they were also very you know as far as as photo realistic as you could get you know yeah. they were they were really striving for that so it's interesting to hear that that was like always a priority i didn't think you know that 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 would really carry i didn't really think about it from like a, a standpoint of like we want to really go for that that hollywood cinematic real realistic thing because it's a video game about like you know someone shooting ice balls at each other and like spearing <laughs> each other you know things like that you you know but it's you're right like the the graphics have always been striving for realism mm. and Absolutely. and it's very cool even like goro which is like you can't have it like a four-armed <laughs> actor like even goro is like super realistic so yeah it was like a little clay model yeah oh is it, if it was i hope so yeah yeah, cool. it's the real clay model that they repositioned and stuff. Oh, man, they should sell that on eBay. That would go for so much. Oh. <laughs> I'm just if, if, if NetherRealm ever needs the cash, I'm sure they could do that. But I have I a they, weird feeling that they don't. <laughs> so. I don't think so. No, I just I think yeah. it'd be fun just to see what it'd go for. But but anyways, anyways, I digress. So <laughs> now that I've got us completely off track on how to sell things from old video games on eBay. Um, so I would love to you know dig into the music of Mortal Kombat a little bit but before I'd love to just hear a bit about like kind of your start for people who aren't familiar with you mm -hmm. like how you started at LucasArts right as a staff composer yeah I mean before that I was I, I'd actually been writing video game music since I was like 13 uh, it's it's a career that I knew I wanted to do uh, for a very long time ever since <laughs> you can kind of see in the background but like ever since I played uh, Final Fantasy 7 um, ah. I, that's the game that told me like, yeah, I've been a musician my whole life, you know, performing piano and doing a ton of improvisation. But then I played that game and it was like, oh, this is specifically what I'm going to do with music. I'm going to write music, original tunes for video games. And so all throughout high school and college, I found um, various indie and mod projects online. Uh, this is a long, long time ago. So long before the current era of indie. Um, so it wasn't it was just very different. I'll leave it at that. But, um, you know, I was finding these projects. I was trying to develop a style and kind of keep up with 
um, the way the industry was going. If you think about it, it, I started on PlayStation 1, writing that style of music. Um, and then as time went on, different elements kind of added and you know things got more cinematic, for instance, and then PS3 happened and then it was kind of a different vibe and now PS4 and that's a different vibe entirely too. But it was all about kind of constantly reinventing how I was approaching game music. Um, as I was taking on all of these indie projects. And then uh, once I graduated, I was doing, you know, more work on that indie field. Um, and some friends that I had met at the Game Developers Conference uh, mm -hmm. were now working at LucasArts. Um, Jesse Harlan, who was the music supervisor, and Damien Kaspauer, who was a, a tech uh, audio designer. And uh, they were working on the Force Unleashed series and they needed an extra music editor because uh, there was just so much work to do in such a compressed amount of time. And uh, Jesse was so slammed constantly with all kinds of other stuff. And he really just wanted to do a lot more original composition, which he had no time for anymore. Uh, so they brought me on to help with that. And over the years of LucasArts, I started off doing music editing, which in that case was um, mostly editing the scores from the films, the Star Wars movies, John Williams' uh, brilliant orchestral scores, to be used in the games uh, for cutscenes and for in-game loops and whatnot. Uh, but as time went on, I decided to kind of expand my position as much as I could. So first it was learning implementation. Uh, we had a proprietary game engine, but um, I learned uh, Python and Lua scripting so I could handle the implementation on my own instead of having to rely on level designers like we used to. Oh, snap. And, uh, eventually WISE for Force Unleashed 2 and uh, other proprietary systems for the different games we did, like Monkey Island, for instance. And uh, I kind of became the music tech person of the group. And then as time went on further, I started doing more original composition as well, uh, starting with uh, The Old Republic. Um, actually, starting with the Force Unleashed DLCs, I did uh, quite a bit of music for those. but. Um, properly on Old Republic. And that was the first time I worked with a, a full, you know, live orchestra and choir, which was an amazing experience, as you can imagine. And no kidding. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was the um, contracted orchestra out in Bratislava, as well as the Skywalker Symphony, quote unquote, which is basically um, uh, musicians union members within the Bay Area performing at Skywalker Ranch. And uh, that was also just an unbelievable experience, uh, learning how to work very efficiently um, within the time constraints of an orchestra that costs, what, $5 every second or something like that. Yeah, I was about and, to say, yeah. I'd, I'd be yeah. pissing myself if that was the first orchestra I was working with. <laughs> it, was, it was a little terrifying. But thankfully, I, I, you know, we had an amazing team. It was uh, Lenny Moore, uh, Gordy Hab, uh, Jesse also writing, and then Mark Grisky was our lead composer. Um, and so with all that talent in the room, it was like, all right, you know, maybe something will go wrong and it obviously does, but, uh, there's like a million years of experience just in one room at any given time. So, uh, awesome. it went, it went quite well, despite, you know, how difficult it was to cram that much music, uh, into so little time. And then, um, I did one last major project at LucasArts, which was Star Wars First Assault. And for that one, uh, I was now the music supervisor and the composer for the game. Uh, it was a multiplayer uh, shooter, competitive multiplayer. Uh, and uh, we recorded the score at Abbey Road Studios with the London Symphony Orchestra. It's just this amazing experience. Um, unfortunately, the game uh, was canceled once LucasArts was uh, disbanded. Uh, so the music kind of never got released, which is you know sort of one of the big shames of I've had to endure because uh, it was it was quite a score. I mean, it was I think eighty minutes of music or something like that, and um, I spent about two years developing this whole interactive music system for that project that uh, was really custom scoring everyone's individual experience with this whole uh, kind of statistics based uh, system that basically the uh, the AI would determine not only what music to play but also when to play it. Um, and it always just kind of uh, it was about it was based on like tweaking the system rather than putting in specific individual cues. Uh, so you didn't really know when music would play, but it would. I mean, designers would come up to me all the time and be like, "I was in this situation, and uh, uh, all the enemies were 
searching for me and I was hiding in this vent, perfect music played. How did you figure out what, and the answer is I have no idea. It was just the system worked its magic and, and there it is. Um, Damn. But you know, that, that all <laughs> went down, uh, unfortunately. And then I went uh, freelance and then I started off uh, with Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris. Uh, which was one of my favorite projects I'd ever done. It was, it was great, like, kind of taking the handcuffs off a little bit and being able to do whatever I wanted with the orchestra, not constrained to the Star Wars sound. Yep. Uh, and uh, maybe that's a bad enough. Oh. because obviously- I didn't know, I didn't think about that. Though. That's, I think that's yeah. a really good, I mean, that is, I mean, you've got to work, you got to work in the lane you got to work in. And yeah, Star it, Wars, it, that yeah. is a brand you're working for. You're working it it for absolutely is, yeah. yeah. I mean, you are playing in, um, you know, the John Williams sandbox. Uh, yep. That said, there's very little that uh, you can do with an orchestra that John Williams hasn't done already. But just the fact that it's like, okay, orchestra forward, period. That does limit it quite a bit. And, and with Lara Croft, I wanted to incorporate lots of world instruments, a little bit more electronic kind of sound design stuff. And uh, I also wanted to be able to use the piano however I felt like it. And whereas in Star Wars, there's actually specific rules about how you are supposed to use it. It's, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I was gonna say, I can't think of any piano in Star Wars. Where is there a piano? Is there a piano there in Star Wars? Um, you can double however you like, and that's fine. Uh, but as far as very overt piano usage, uh, in the style, the specific style of the films, it's just reserved for Hoth, the Ice Planet Hoth. Oh. So if you listen to Empire Strikes Back, you'll hear tons of very overt piano use, um, especially in the beginning of the film in Hoth. Well, thanks. Now I have to go watch all of Star Wars again. That yeah. you've, just, <laughs> you've just done that to me. Yeah, ah. I've actually got the wailing electric guitar solos too. Those are in there. Too. Ah. Wait, what? Yeah. No, there's not. I, I, I swear. <laughs> All right, don't tell me where they are. Episode two. Oh, episode two. man. Ah. It's pretty weird. Synthesizers there in two. But... You're blowing my mind. This is the second time my mind's been blown today. Oh, man. <laughs> I can't handle it. I don't remember. What was the first one? I was, talk I was interviewing someone else earlier, and they said something else. Oh, they said that there's a Neapolitan chord in the Power Rangers theme song, and it blew my mind. And now this. I, I have to go rewatch Power Rangers and Star Wars. It's going to be an awesome week. It's really... Is it the really? third phrase in the? I forget what a Neapolitan six is. Uh, it's a or a Neapolitan uh, chord. I don't know if it's a, ne a Neapolitan six. Uh, I think it's something different. But I know a Neapolitan chord is like a major chord on the flat second degree. Oh yeah, scale. yeah. It's the third. So. It's the third line of the chorus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but now I have to hear it because like, I never appreciated it, which is like yeah. ridiculous now. But yeah. I'm a huge Power Rangers nerd, so I won't go down really? the road because that'll just derail it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, boy. So uh, we got to talk about VR Troopers next thing because I'm looking at oh. my full DVD set of every VR Troopers episode. You are I lying, think. sir. There's no way that's true. Oh, my gosh. VR Troopers. Yeah. VR, VR, troopers. Absolutely. Yeah. All of them. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You, sir. It's a whole thing. Instant, instant <laughs> friend. I, I, I admire and trust you with everything. Yeah. Excellent taste. <laughs> excellent judgment. Well. This guy. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. We're going to have to have a, lo a long talk about all that stuff. Yeah, but before we time. before we go too far down that, because I really went down the Power Rangers road further than I should have earlier. But um, <laughs> VR Troopers, oh man, Masked Rider, so all that, all those things around that. It's a good time. VR yeah. Troopers did not get their fair shake though. They should have. That should have gone long longer. I think. Yeah, I mean they had a linear. You know what? This is going to turn into a whole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. We'll, we'll we'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. Uh, <laughs> Ah, oh, so good. All right. So anyways, um, back to, so you'd said something earlier that I want to circle back to before I sure. forget completely. Um, you'd said that when you, so you had been friends with someone who then went on to work at LucasArts. Yeah. And I thought that that was really important because a lot of people out there, like one of the biggest things that people ask me, actually the single biggest thing is how do I connect with game developers? How do I find the jobs? And I think that people have this really like this thing in their head where they're looking for the job instead of looking for the people. And, yeah. and I think that patience is a huge factor in all this. 
And until so you like, obviously, you know, you've got a really good, strong, you know, a lot of momentum behind you in your career. But I think patience, even then, um, mm. with your relationships is huge. How long was it like, when did you meet that person from like when you got into the door at LucasArts? Just curious. Uh, well, I, I, I would actually like to answer a slightly different question. The sure. answer to, well, just to, to answer that is like, I don't know, maybe a year or two, something like that. But okay. um, I, the, taking it from a different angle, um, the way I look to, at it is if you're, if you're just starting out, um, think more towards the very future, like 10 years from now. And like, how would you like to work? Would you like to work with someone that you've never met before and who you've just cold emailed and you have no connections with this person? You don't know if they're like cool or if they are gonna be you know, not, not so cool to work with. Or would you rather work with someone who's like a good friend of yours? Uh, someone who you, you, know, you get along, you have like similar senses of humor, similar interests outside the gamut of like video games, game audio, music, whatever. Uh, for most people, it would be the latter. They would want to work with their friends. Um, so the, what I advise when you're going to these things like game conventions and whatnot is like, yes, you'll meet some people who are big name, whatever. Maybe they can hire you. Great. You know, but I would gravitate more towards folks who are, are quite talented, but also who you just get along with really well. Uh, people who you you just jive with, you're on the same wavelength and and whatnot, regardless of what their position is currently. Um, because first off, if they're good, water seeks its own level. Inevitably, you know, um, it might take a while, but uh, yep, they'll they'll get somewhere. And uh, you you kind of realize as time goes on that your worth as a member of this industry really is in tandem with the worth of your circle. Like you can be super talented, but if your circle is non-existent or does not consist of other very talented people, then, you know, I mean, you, you can, you know, best of luck, but it's yeah, not likely tough. that you'll be getting, uh, getting work and getting, you know, whatever. But if you find those people who are, you know, both very talented and you get along with them really well and you can see a friendship lasting like forever, basically, then it's, you know, that, that's the ideal that's what you really should be looking for. It's almost like you, with the power of your future self, are interviewing other people rather than it's like, I have to get the job now, if that makes any sense. Um, no, that's actually a really interesting way of flipping it on a TED because I always talk about like how long it takes, you know, and it, it, it's about building relationships and thinking about them like friendships, but I never really thought about comparing it to that other approach. Well, I mean, I talk about how ineffective that other approach is of like cold calling and cold emailing. And that's just, yeah. it's a numbers game. And it's really, it's a tough, tough way to try to make it work. But I never thought of it like, what if that did work? How that scenario would be, you know, working with someone who yeah. you just like had one email conversation with. Now all of your interactions are, you know, completely based around this, you know, this email relationship which, you know, even like you and I now, we've got a little bit of a rapport. This is the first time we're speaking, but I already know we've got some of that <laughs> 90s superhero jam going on. You know, like we've got a little bit of rapport and that, you know, over years is going to be a yeah. lot more fun to work with than someone who might be even be paying me a lot, but might be not nearly as fulfilling to work with. I yeah, thought about and, it. and the... the I, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely work with people that I've not, you know, I never met the audio director of uh, Nether Realm until we finished the score entirely. Uh, we'd never met in person until, until afterwards. And we happened to do like a lecture in Chicago where, where he lives. But um, it's more about like, make sure that there's some sort of a connection. Like usually it's, I'm one step removed from all the clients that I've had the last couple of years. Um, like maybe I had a coworker at LucasArts who worked with the audio director of say Sledgehammer. And so mm -hmm. now it's, it's, it's not really a cold email. It's like a lukewarm email when yep. I pinged them. And that's how I pretty much got the meetings that eventually led to me uh, scoring Call of Duty World War II was that I had that mutual connection and then, um, you know, it kind of snowballed from there. And similarly with, um, with Rich Carl over at uh, NetherRealm Studios. 
uh, it turned out that he either played Lara Croft in Temple of Osiris or he went to the GDC talk that I gave about it. Um, mm -hmm. He was already familiar uh, with my work and with my process and um, I contacted them I guess at like just the right time and he was getting demos from people and we just talked on the phone. He was really cool um, and uh, he gave me like advice on how to do the demo because he's also a quite a quite a fantastic composer himself actually and he gave me advice on how to write in the Mortal Kombat style and uh, you know I just went off and wrote a piece sent it in and uh, eventually they were like yeah let's uh, let's do this thing and um, it's it's just so much better than the completely random like I have no connection to you but uh, I want you to hire me even though you have no idea who I want who I am kind of approach um, but that's just my my two cents. Everyone does it differently. I'm sure some people have had great success with cold emails, and that's like, you know, more yeah. power to them. I I just feel as though if you're going to do that, then maybe make sure that you're also looking towards the more grounded, long-term relationships uh, rather than just shooting for the, you know, whatever you might call it. Yeah. If nothing else, you've got more things that can kind of come to you versus you having to oh. always scramble and go out to them. So I think there are a lot of benefits to 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 a balanced approach, um, like you're saying. But it, I, I, like I said, I've never thought about kind of flipping it on its head. And and some people like you know like you're saying, some people never you know meet in person until the project's really far along. And some people yeah. never meet the people who buy their music off of a marketplace and <laughs> pop it. You know, so there's so so there's all sorts of different ways. It's it's you have a lot of options. It's kind of yeah. I guess you know you get a lot of options. Do what works for you everyone um cool awesome so mortal kombat 11 you just mentioned something about like you know learning how to write like in sort of that mortal kombat style can you share with us any of like that kind of like those i mean obviously we hear it you know we hear that it's it's consistent but i'm just kind of curious what the um like what the the behind the scenes uh, you know, thoughts are in terms of maintaining that sound over 11 games? Yeah, um, I mean, really, it's the brainchild, uh, sorry, brainchild of, um, oh, how am I spacing on his name? Dan Forden. Sorry, this is a long day. Um, but yeah. Dan Forden was the original composer of Mortal Kombat 1 through 4. And uh, he's been writing for all of the games. To, he's still there, actually. He wrote for 11 as well, some of the in-game music. But, awesome. Um, his style is very interesting because uh, I found out through just an interview he did uh, ages ago uh, that we have a lot of very similar influences. Um, we both love Igor Stravinsky, Thomas Newman. Um, uh, he's really big into uh, prog rock as well. And um, the, the Hindemith, I think he mentioned, which is like, you don't really hear that, that name thrown around very often. Mm. So it was like, oh, wow. Um, but I, once I read this interview, I looked at, um, well, two things. One, I remembered, like, I was addicted to Mortal Kombat 3 as a kid. And even before, I think, I decided to write game music, I could play the whole soundtrack on piano, just start to finish, because I play that game so freaking much. Um, awesome. And I think that some of that kind of just downloaded and burned into my memory, along with the Stravinsky influences. Because once I read this interview, this is I think on MKX or MK9 or whatever, I then looked at the music I wrote for Lara Croft and realized it sounds already kind of Mortal Kombat-ish um, with its use of texture. Um, I do a lot of uh, these sort of big Stravinsky and full orchestra tutis, uh, often with syncopation. Um, a lot of the Mortal Kombat sound is, a, is based around the octatonic mode and um, he does an interesting thing with it where he often will have bass lines that they're they're grounded in the octatonic but they kind of jump around in unexpected ways like the intervals he uses uh, they're not like it's not it's never a simple stepwise up and down yeah it's always kind of jerky and kind of uh, unsettling uh, intentionally um, and then on top of that, there's usually quite a lot of percussion, usually um, East Asian in nature, and lots of borrowed instruments from all over the world. Uh, he often uses lots of synthesizer along with his scores uh, as well. 
And so for 11, uh, I basically just looked back to what he was doing for Mortal Kombat 2, uh, way back in 1990, whatever. And uh, I just said, okay, well, what if we took that sound as close as we can get it, but sort of Hollywoodized it up? Uh, so I had, you know, like as, as realistic orchestra as I could produce. And then, of course, the live orchestra recorded in uh, Budapest, Hungary. And then uh, I, I basically figured out like, all right, well, who are all of the world musicians that I can bring onto this project? Um, so, I mean, the credits list is kind of like a mile long of all these people that I worked with um, on the Gujang, uh, Kathy Chan Chan Jin, who was, uh, I think at the time she was a student at uh, the SF Conservatory. Uh, I was cool. guest lecturing there and we talked about her compositions. And then she was like, oh, by the way, I also play this instrument. And I was like, tell me more. And then, you know, months passed and I called her up and I was like, hey, so. <laughs> Remember play that instrument. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then a bunch of instruments from the Middle East, uh, uh, from China, and um, lots of different vocals and other solos. Uh, so I really wanted to make sure that um, it had a diverse sound. Uh, to support the diverse characters and then lots of like guitar and bass uh tons of synthesizer i mean you can even see some of the stuff i was using now lots of these kinds of uh, hardware Whoa. and uh the idea was i wanted every character to have a light motif and a signature sound uh nice. so that it could kind of give a logic to the score and, uh, yeah sort of bound together because uh, the danger of Mortal Kombat is that like, and the writers I'm sure have to, to deal with this every single game. This is a title, a franchise where you can have, uh, you know, a, an elder god, like an actual god and a uh, army person and like a police cop and a dude with four arms and, you know, a person who can shoot ice. And they all are entering in the same tournament, like the same weight class, the same like, you know, there's there's no difference they're all just here hollywood yep. you know, it, and it, it all makes sense it's all fine yeah, I mean, yeah. it kind of doesn't but it's sort of you know we're just taking all our action figures and bashing them together exactly that is exactly it yep so it's like how do you unify that because it's 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 so crazy and diverse but at the same time you want to make sure that every character has uh their own vibe and everyone has to kind of um have a voice that that can carry them through the score so that's what i what i think i i i brought to it like previously for for various reasons there weren't really character themes uh in mortal kombat the way that there are in street fighter um because mostly because the stages were never character-based stages they were always like story-based so the characters never really got that so that was kind of an amazing opportunity actually um being able to uh give like a, a theme to these characters that I personally have known for what, 25 years or something. And now I get to actually put notes to them and be like, this is what Shao Kahn sounds like. This is what Kitana sounds like. Uh, that, that was kind of an amazing experience. Awesome, man. Yeah, it must be unreal for like, I, I, uh, I ended up singing on the Final Fantasy 15 soundtrack and I remember how unreal that was for me. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which was the same way, like as your the student you spoke to, where it's like, you know, hey, you're a singer, right? It's like, yeah. It's like, uh, can you come to the? Can you do a recording gig? It was like, sure. I don't oh. know what it's for, but it sounds great. And I had to like sign an NDA, and they're like, okay. It's must, you know, like because I had been playing those games since the you know early '90s, so yeah. it must be. I mean, you know, just to be there and be singing. It was oh. was mind blowing. So being able to like put your own like your own mark on it must have been yeah. crazy. Were Were you working uh, out of Boston, like with Shota? Yeah. Or, yep. Oh, that's awesome. oh yeah, yeah. That's, maybe that's yeah. how we know each other. Now maybe. It's, oh, okay, yeah. Now it's kind of okay. Okay. So all right. Well, we'll have to yeah, we'll have to figure that out. There must be that must be the connection. Yeah. So um. So yeah, he I, he just asked me like on the random like on the, like, the floor at Pax East because we had been, you know, chatting for like a year. At that point, yeah. a year or two, and and he's just like, we need some singers. You're a singer, right? And I th thought I remember you mentioning that two years ago or something. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'm a singer. So, and then, boom, there I am. And now I'm, you know, next if I manage the choir that does that stuff now. So, 
it's uh it's a oh, small awesome. world but it's but it's cool it's, it's so fun i mean it's such a weird time we live in where we can take those like i mean first of all that the franchises are still around this much you know this many years later but yeah. that you know we've you know we can now interact with them and and put our mark on them and and uh, be a part of it just it's just crazy i would have never i would have never thought it i would definitely dreamed it but i would have never thought it so but uh i've got time for a couple more questions here if you're up for it sure yeah sorry yeah. i started late so feel free to oh no 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 it's no worries it's like this is the craziest week literally in a long time for a lot of people so <laughs> You know, I, I, uh, I like was frequently checking today to make sure I knew it was Monday because, you know, <laughs> I went into work on, you know, I went into work on Thursday and, uh, went home and got an email Thursday night that work was shut down until April. So it's like, okay, great. Um, so here, I've got these couple of weird questions for you. Sure. Um, so this one is, so I want you to imagine if you had to start over today and you knew everything that you know like knowledge wise, skills wise, but you have no connections mm. and uh, all you have to work with is a laptop and whatever your doll of choice is and 500 bucks. How would you start over today knowing, you know, all that you know, having been writing music and getting into the industry for the past mm. 20 some years? Mm. That's a tricky one. Uh, so it we're talking about I, i'm starting today in like 2020 not today in totally like, so it's a different game different different yeah, game yeah. but but so, I mean, but you know you know you know you know still yeah well th there's a couple principles that i would bring back to the table um that i eventually uh learned along the way as far as i'll start with gear because that's a little easier um first off uh all in the box uh there's no point right away of getting you know, stuff like these synthesizers I point out, pointed out. Um, uh, I really love uh, Native Instruments Contact. I think that mm -hmm. having a full version of that is extremely important. Uh, it's, it's expensive, but um, there's usually ways to get a deal. Like there's usually, I think they do Christmas sales or, or whatever. Maybe they definitely just, do Black Friday sales if not. Yeah, so. something like that. And totally. if you can, um, it's, that's best because the full version uh, not not the player, but like actual, yeah. Film, I think should be everyone's first purchase, um, and then after that, uh, getting, I think a, de well, you know what, uh, times may have changed, but I think getting a decent reverb is still the most important thing that you will have to pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's free VSTs for really good compression and eq uh limiter like one of the limiters that i use all the time is is free in, and it's not bad at all tls maximizer or whatever it's called um it's quite transparent actually and uh so the most of the stuff that you can uh you can just get for for free you know vsts or donationware maybe but um as far as stuff that you still kind of have to pay for, I think reverb is like, yeah, there's, as far as I know, there's no like great free reverbs and reverbs are super important for cinematic music. Uh, I would recommend the Valhalla set, um, Valhalla delay, Valhalla reverb, Valhalla room. Um, Valhalla shimmer is amazing for special effects and all of their plugins are, I say there, it's really one guy, Stu Sean. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the way, lives here. Uh, I just ran into him at like a guitar store like a couple months ago. Like, I was shopping for a pedal, and he gave his advice. And it's like, yeah, for my plugin. I was like, your plugin? What do you do? And it turns out that he's like my favorite VST developer. It just happens to be in some weird coincidence. Awesome. But, speaking speaking of VSTs that we love, you uh, also co-founded Impact Soundworks. I did. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, that, I didn't realize. I mean, that, yeah. I didn't realize until a couple of weeks ago. And that is, I mean, probably the most beloved, you know, Super Audio Cart and Super Audio Boy, I think are, are like the most beloved, you know, accessible ways for people to create chip tune music without having to really dig into the tech and the science of how it was made originally. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. It's super authentic sounding just from my own, you know, I, I, I think it's the best on the market for 
mm. that that approach. Um, and I, 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 yeah. So, so just, just, like, just you know, I had nothing whatsoever to do with that. Um, no, hey, that was all Andrew Aversa. Uh, he's kind of, I mean, the way Impact Sound Works happened was I, I had some space in between uh, indie film gigs like a million million years ago. And I had like one project that I'd wanted to do for a while and never had time, but now I have the time and the gear and whatever. So I created Impact Steel, which was a metallic percussion library that I still use all the time today. It's like super great that I had time to do that. And this is awesome. back in the days of like VI control and Northern sounds or whatever. So I made the library in Contact 2 and uh, I showed some people demos and I was like, hey, would y'all be interested in this? And they were like, yes, give it to me now. And I'm like, okay, how do I sell it? And the people on the forums, they, they, they were so nice. They, they explained exactly how much they wanted to pay for it. They gave me um, advice on how to sell it. Like uh, there was some website that, uh, uh, it, it, it's so ancient history, but some website that lets you sell digital stuff. And yep. yeah. Uh, like, uh, like Gumroad or something like that. Something like, yeah. yeah. And I set up the whole thing. And uh, after that came out and made a surprising amount of money, um, then uh, Andrew contacted me. He also lived in Philadelphia at the time. And he was like, hey, I want in on this. Um, and he had an idea for a sitar library because no one had really, this is long before Cine Samples, 8 Dio, a lot of these companies, yep. indie, or they're really not indie anymore because they're huge, but like before the bespoke sample library development thing was uh, in existence. Really, it was just Native Instruments, East West, and Big Fish, and that was it. Uh, so yeah, we just did a sitar library. We recorded it in Philadelphia, and then we did Koto Nation uh, in New York City with the Koto soloist from Memoirs of a Geisha. And Sweet. Yeah, it kind of snowballed from there. At that point, Andy kind of took the reins because I was busy with um, game work. I got hired at LucasArts and whatnot. Um, but uh, later on, I did Vocal Lisa, the Slavic Choir. And that's the most recent thing that I did with them. And that's a project I'd wanted to do for like 10 years. Um, I don't think I've heard that one. I had to look that one up. That sounds cool. I'm a, yeah. I'm a choir guy. In college, I was like way into choir. I, I was at a very fine choir and we went around yeah. the world and sang in competitions and stuff. So I'm oh, always wow. interested to hear choirs from around the world because they're all very different. Um, yeah, it's a Balkan kind of style. Um, but it's it sort of works for a lot of different genres. I use it a lot in Lara Croft and a little bit in Mortal Kombat as well. It's awesome. Cool. All right. One more for you. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Here's here it is. This is this is uh I think you gotta kind of bear with this one. It's slightly weirder. So imagine that you uh had to train a protege who mm -hmm. has, you know, basic you know, musicianship skills, they know their way around the software, um, but they maybe are very new to writing. And you have to got to train them in two months to write a video game score. And there's a million dollars on the line. What do you spend those two months focusing on with, with this person before you cut them loose to do the work? I'd have them transcribe first, um, first and foremost. That's kind of how I learned how to write anyway. I never really had, I mean, I had composition professors and stuff in college, but the way I learned how to write was I was transcribing video game music, um, starting with, you know, simple stuff like Super Nintendo is probably the easiest entryway point yep. uh, because of the way it produces sound. It's only got eight voices. It's, it's sampled. So it's going to be pretty easy to translate to general MIDI, which is what I was using. Um, but in doing transcriptions, you actually learn quite a lot about how, the music was written and why they made decisions about it. Um, people talk a lot about like, oh, I'm actively listening. And it's totally different from that. It's, it's way more uh, like if you active listen, then you hear what they did. But if you transcribe, you understand why they did it that way. Um, so that teaches you harmony, form, a little bit melody as well. Um, I think all composers should sing, even if they have terrible voices like me. Uh, but singing uh especially once i started singing like regularly like you know joining church choir once i um uh oh actually i was in church choir for a while actually but especially once we had a more advanced choir when i lived in san francisco um you know you're going to be uh studying all these different melodies um from lots of different eras 
uh, the denominate, I'm Roman Catholic, so like we have quite a wide range, literally hundreds of years worth of um, yeah materials that we draw from regularly. And uh, doing that, it just kind of, it just alters the brain. It just teaches you melodies somehow. You, you kind of have to live in it and you understand things like a good theme is not magic. It's, it's work. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of, you're not just like, bam, this awesome theme just happened and, you know, great, now let's be brilliant. But no, you have to move this note over, you know, by an eighth note, or you have to like say like, well, what's the contour of this? You know, uh, should it go up or should it go down? Or like what the intervals, what does an interval mean? How does this melody, just without any harmony at all, just the tune itself, how does it correspond to the character or the situation? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would say like, that's another kind of cross training, even before you've learned to write a single note. Uh, I think these are both incredibly important. I've been in this situation, I, I have to admit many times where people are asking me like, oh, what's your advice here, whatever. And I always tell them, please just go transcribe. I can give you recommendations, pieces, Super Nintendo. It's, it's the easiest entry point. They never do it. <laughs> <laughs> they always it's, it's, it is hard i mean it's it takes a long time but you're right it's like you yeah. if you if you, if you transcribe one song yeah it's like you just read a book yeah it's it's not it's not easy i, I admit and it, but it gets easier as you do it um you know maybe start yeah. off with like a 30 second super nintendo i don't know the chrono trigger victory thing you know whatever something small and short digestible and get it perfect note accurate and then do another and another and another until finally you start to understand it gets way easier as you go along. I mean, almost before every project I do, I do some sort of a transcription. Um, like before Mortal Kombat, I transcribed um, a bunch of like take performances because I wanted to make sure that I was using real rhythms and not just Hollywood BS, if you know what I mean. Yep. And awesome. uh, you know, before Call of Duty, uh, I, I was transcribing some other stuff that ended up not having anything to do with the score, but um, uh, I think it was like some Stephen Price or Ryan Amon film scores that used a lot more with uh, electronics. Um, and of course, before any Star Wars gig, I do some transcriptions just to refresh my memory. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very important uh, part of the process. This is how composition was taught for hundreds of years. Um, it's kind of been lost now that you can just, you know, hit a note on a keyboard and then bam, there's your, there's your score. But uh, I still value that. I mean, I can, I, I hate to say it this way, but you know, there's composers who, who have a strong personal relationship with harmony. And those are the people that I love to listen to their music and uh, I'm working with those kinds of people. Um, others are more about uh, texture and, and production, which is also fantastic. I mean, I, I love music like that as well, but uh, you know, if, if I'm going to be, training someone to take on this million dollar gig. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would like them to add to the, you know, sadly not very huge group of composers who value harmony as the way that they tell the story. Um, nowadays, telling the story with texture is a lot more, um, more popular. Yeah. Great. It's you know, a fantastic way to tell the story very quickly. I mean, that's why I have all these, you know, synthesizers and stuff. But having that old school kind of mentality towards harmony, um, it's just something I personally enjoy. Dude, speaking my language on so many different points. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I always, I always say that, like for me, melody, which is in, you know, when you're doing it right, it's in tandem with the harmony, yeah. and and that is lost a lot today because of the at least you know in in a lot of Western music, there's a real strong uh, push towards the technology and the textures and uh, the production versus the, the craft of like song of like tune writing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And at least in my opinion, and I think that that was like one of the reasons why all those like the, the composers that we listened to in those Super Nintendo games, a lot of those composers that were really like, like Final Fantasy VII, Japanese music was super you know, colorful with its harmony and it's super melodically driven and you had to have a really well-written melody if you're going to like throw in a bunch of crazy, you know, prog rock and J-pop chords in there. So you, you had to, you ha I mean, you had to know, you had to have control of that melody in order to follow along with the harmony. Yeah. And 
you know, like you said, now it's, you can be like, all right, I'm going to just, you know, take the chord loop and I'm going to copy and paste it. And I can, there's a lot of, a lot of that. And there's a lot of things that you can do with that. Um, but I, I agree that I think that it's, it's, it's tough. I think it's really tough for me. The, the toughest part about it is that when people want to learn, it's really hard for them to learn that stuff now. Yeah. Um, it's not as, and it's getting harder. Like teach me how to make, this awesome sound in in serum or so face plant whatever uh, it's it's not as cool or as hip um, but I think there's still some value to it I think there's a lot of value in combining both as well um, totally yeah especially I mean, like, when you're working with like limited resources too yeah absolutely I mean I, so the for me one of the interesting solutions that I had on on Mortal Kombat 11 was that you know we have all these characters and they're interacting and I wanted to make sure that we were using the light motifs as, um, as effectively as possible. So what I made sure to do was that um, almost every character has a non-orchestral light motive mm -hmm. to the point where you can just have like one note and you know like, oh, that's gotta be a revenant, that's gotta be Katana, that's gotta be, you know, whatever. Um, and in doing that, uh, and also I, I tried to make as many of the themes as possible fit into the octatonic mode. Yep. Uh, so that you could actually take almost any melody and any other melody and put them right on top of each other or staggered or, you know, counterpoint or whatever. And it would, it would actually just kind of work. Um, awesome. And I could use that to say like, you know, maybe Jax is talking and he's, you know, he's in a sort of state. I don't want to spoil the story for people who haven't played yet, but he's clearly being influenced by this other character over here who's off screen and not even mentioned in the scene, but it's like, Clearly, you're just being this character's puppet right now. So I can use her theme but with Jax and, you know, the other stuff that's going on. And it, it was just a much more fluent way of scoring the scene and kind of adding something to it rather than um, if I were to rely entirely on texture, then I would have only had the emotional side, but none of the informative uh, side of music. It would almost like, you know, you, you kind of get the emotion uh, from the dialogue and, and the scenery and whatnot. And that's obviously very important too, but um, music can add even more meaning to the scene and give a different angle that maybe wasn't quite so obvious um, just right off the bat with the other parts of the cinema. Awesome. Oh man, this is gonna be, I think people are gonna be really happy that they listened to you talk <laughs> uh, because I, first of all, I mean, I think that that you've got a really good balanced way of thinking about all these different elements of what goes into this career. Um, but it's also just, I mean, you've, you've dropped a lot of like really interesting kind of nuggets and uh, really interesting, I think, perspectives, which I think is like really useful because you can take a perspective and you can do a lot with a, like a new way of looking at something. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, thank you so much for spending some time tonight to, or this afternoon for you tonight for me. Um, uh, answering some questions and talking about your career and your music. I know it's going to really pump people up to, uh, to hear, uh, hear about someone who is, you know, has just worked on so many cool things and, and uh, I, I know that they're going to get a lot of value out of it. And I know it's going to help a lot of people. So I really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. And thank you again for having me. My pleasure. Folks go play Mortal Kombat 11, <laughs> go download spawn, you know, yeah. and, and uh, and then also uh, before we leave, uh, you have a, a newer pro a new project that you why don't you tell us about your new project real quick before we sign sure, off here yeah. too. So the new the new game I'm working on is called A New The Distant Light. Um, you can just go uh, thedistantlight.com is our website. It's a two and a half D Metroidvania. Uh, it's all it's a sort of exploration type puzzle type uh, action shooter game. Uh, it, set play, it takes place on an alien planet, and you are one of the last survivors of Earth that's been set out to do some mission. Um, Earth is in shambles, and you have to do something. Uh, but the whole game is shrouded in mystery. There's no dialogue. Uh, there's no text. You have to figure out the story sort of through the environmental storytelling. So the music is actually quite important with this world, uh, cool. which has a very unique art style. And it's probably my, in fact, it's almost definitely my most unique score to date because instead of taking cinematic reference and influence, 
all the music is influenced by 20th century art music composers. Like um, mm. there's lots of uh, Debussy, John Adams, Fratavara, uh, and Bartok influence throughout the score, uh, as well as lots of uh, classic uh, analog synthesizer, like 60s Moog style sounds, um, kind of fused together to hopefully create a very unique uh, palette for the game. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really a labor of love. I've been working on this project for years and years, and uh, it's coming out pretty soon. I can't give a release date, but uh, soonish is all I can say. And well, when uh, it does, let me know so I can shout it from the rooftops. Absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. uh, we'll be excited to hear the music. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. And, and uh, if you're listening to this later on, um, go check out uh, Wilbert's uh, music all over the, the internet. He's got a really good uh, you know, sampling on his website if you just want to get a taste and you know, don't know what he's about yet. Um, and uh, just go play all the games. Go get a new when it's out. Go play Mortal Kombat 11 and beat up Arnold Schwarzenegger. Have a good time. 